Welcome to The Disruption Is Now. Join us on this enlightening journey as we explore how AI is impacting our jobs, careers, lives, and the human experience. Each episode, host Greg Matusky will converse with visionaries and innovators at the forefront of AI, diving into its challenges, opportunities, and impact. So buckle up as we venture into the heart of disruption, and together, let's unfold the future. Well, welcome to another episode of The Disruption Is Now, where we talk about everything AI and how it impacts human communications. I'm Greg Matusky, the host, but I'm also the CEO and founder of Gregory FCA, the large PR agency with offices in New York, Philadelphia. I'm being joined here today by a young, a young entrepreneur who started, who co-founded a company called Your Stake. It's an interesting company. Gabe Rissman is the co-founder of Your Stake, and they're working to help try to make the advisory process simpler through the onboarding process and through the proposal process, and then I guess through the uh, optimization of the whole relationship. Um, did I get that right, Gabe? Is that is that what your stake is all about? Yeah, I, we are trying to make it easier for advisors to win more clients faster. And that means reducing manual entry and just making the whole process easier of bringing someone in, storing all their notes, making it useful, and then building a proposal for them and a portfolio to uh, just make it so clear the value that you can get with the advisor versus where they currently are. Now, let's talk about that because I'm always fascinated by how AI can really focus on the most tedious and manual part of a job, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something you would have had expected would have been solved long ago because financial services have some of the most intelligent uh, professionals in the world. But really, there was all kind. There was all kind of friction in that process. Let's review it from the beginning. What mm -hmm. were those friction points between advisor and client that, for a long time, were just an accepted part of the relationship? If I understand correctly, yeah. So the basic flow that advisors would generally take when working with a prospect is having that initial meeting, and then saying, "Hey, you know." love talking with you. I'd love to offer a complimentary portfolio review. We can see how your portfolio is doing, see if we need to make any tweaks. Maybe you're doing a great job, whatever it might be. And it's oftentimes the advisor will offer that for free. So now the advisor has to be able to get the information of that prospect to be able to run that, that portfolio review or a, a review of whatever financial situation they have. And usually the process is, and this is about 95% of the time, that prospect would then send over all of their financial statements in PDF which, form. Which is a huge pain in the butt for the relationship. I've done that so many times in my life. You know, it, even getting my tax forms to my advisor um, is it, it should be automated. And instead, I got to get it from my accountant, right? Mm -hmm. I got to pull out the right pages. I got to make a. I got to scan it. I got to send it over. It's usually mm -hmm. in the wrong format. Uh, they ask me to rescan it. Then they say, hey, can you just like send it or whatever? So um, <laughs> that that amazed me that we don't have a way of easily getting data into into uh, the process of onboarding. And yeah. you've, you've made that a lot easier. So we make it easier primarily on the advisor side. So you'll still have to talk to your accountant and get the right information over to the advisor. But there's less back and forth because our system is able to save all the time on the advisor side. It's able to recognize what document you sent over. It's able to pull all of the relevant information out of that document. It's able to format that into the appropriate information that the advisor needs. And then it's able to run instant analytics on whatever you send over to be able to inform the advisor of what's going on and allow them to do whatever tinkering and understanding they need. And then allow the advisor to then propose, hey, here's where you're doing things right. Here's where you can maybe improve in some areas. And here's our plan for how to get there. So it really so, automates a lot of that process and allows the advisor, instead of needing to generate it on their own, they're reviewing what the AI puts together, tweaking it, modifying it, and then being able to send that out over to the prospect. Now, can the advisor use a chat bot to, to query it? Tell me about that, because I mm -hmm. think that's really where the world is going. The ability to use natural language processing to find connections and associations that mm -hmm. are, are beyond most professionals. Obviously, we're not 
a lot of advisors are not da- data scientists, even though they can be quants, they're still not <laughs> perhaps there with regard to how they extract information and find connections. Go into that for yeah. us. Yeah, I do know a few, but only a few. So the way that our AI system works is in three parts. The first part is just extracting the information, which uses a combination of standard technology, OCR, optical character recognition, and AI to be able to format, validate, check, and then put it in the right situation. So that's step one for any document. Step two is the AI is able to generate talking points and insights and a plan, essentially. And step three is the advisor can then chat. We call it chat with a portfolio. So it, the advisor can ask questions. The AI system is set on specific guardrails using the data that we generate from our analytics. So it's not going to make up answers. And uh, the, the term of art is hallucinations. It's not going to hallucinate because what it's doing is it's taking your question and it's saying, oh, I think the Your Stake database knows the answer to this question. So it reformats your question into like a query to our database. And then our database has the correct answers with all the numbers and the algorithms. And then it can just direct those answers back to the advisor in a more natural language friendly way. So connecting it with the data really reduces or eliminates hallucinations. But one of my questions is consistency. And I, mm-hmm. I often have this conversation with other I mean, we're content creators at Gregory FCA, big believers in AI. We were probably the first PR agency in the country that created our own internal uh, generative AI platform for content creation. This was before (laughs) ChatGPT. We just had a conversation, you know, uh, about where the puck's going. We saw where the puck was going and we started to build some templated, formatted uh, processes for doing that. And then ChatGPT came along and we're like, Hallelujah. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. we don't have to. At one point, we were thinking, oh, we were delirious. Uh, we'll build an LLM, right? And, and, and uh, thank God uh, ChatGPT <laughs> uh, required us to, uh, gave us a much easier path to that. But consistency, I always talk to writers, we have an advantage because we're not programmers or astrophysicists like you studied in college. We don't expect two plus two to always equal four, right? Mm-hmm. We know that when you're creating, you can have 14 different openings of a, of a blog post or a, or a white paper, all of which are valid and all of which are right, but there's options, right? Mm-hmm. Now, coders, there is no option. And one of the things that really, I think, drives people who are software-specific crazy is that they will be different. We build custom GPTs, for instance, and one day it'll work perfectly, and mm-hmm. the next day – It'll be like your 10-year-old that doesn't want to go to school all of a sudden. I'm mm-hmm. not getting up. I'm not going to the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you deal with the consistency problem or issues, or are there any issues? Sure. So the first is on the statement extraction itself, the way that we deal with that is having multiple validation checks. So anytime something gets extracted, we're running it through several different processes and making sure this adds up to that and this connects with that. So those linkages make sure for the the small edge cases where something might go wrong, we're aware of it, we can correct it, we can notify the user, those types of things. And that all happens automatically. So it's a loop, it it gives you an answer, it checks, it verifies. That's one of the that's one of the theories with uh, video uh, production, how to how to get how to get uh, consistent character or an actual script through the video process where it, mm. it checks, it verifies, it rewrites the prompt, checks, verify, re- rewrites the prompt. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So it's able to do that. And it's everything is a combination of AI tools and just basic algorithms. So it's a combination of doing AI checking itself and the algorithms making sure things match up. Uh, and then for the chat, I think the way that we ensure consistency is – Again, all of the actual answers that it will ever give are deterministic. We say, here's the corpus of data that is going to be the answer to all the questions that someone might ask. If they ask a different question, you say that you don't know. So it will be, it will phrase things differently. Sometimes it'll focus more on uh, one thing versus another thing, but the answers will always be based off of actual correct information that we're, that we're providing it. And that's um, where you really get yeah. into trouble. If you leave, if you leave it to the machine's own devi- devices, right, to come up with an answer where it doesn't know, 
and it wants to please you, mm -hmm. that's where a hallucination will creep in. Mm -hmm. And that's where you need, if you tell it, and I do this myself, I'll say, if you can't find, if I'm doing research, if you can't find the demographics or the numbers, do not make them up. Just <laughs> tell me you couldn't find how many 18 year olds there are in Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you just, just don't, just say you can't you can't do it. So mm -hmm. that that's an interesting uh, cap on any kind of hallucination. And then one other thing also, I was just listening to a podcast with Sam Altman, the, the CEO of OpenAI, and he talked about how he uses ChatGPT. Because it's I mean, it's funny to think that the person that's creating it is also using it to help with just day-to-day -day stuff. Was that Lex Friedman by chance? It, it was a Lex uh, yeah, Friedman podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just listened to it last week. Yeah, it's um that one was Really interesting is they talked about the whole board drama that went down. But the, the takeaway that I had, he said that he most uses it as a brainstorming assistant. And when it's a brainstorming assistant, there's no such thing as, I guess, correct, right? It's, it's something that you can talk through things, bounce ideas back and forth. So that's another thing to deal with the consistency problem is brainstorming assistant. You kind of don't want consistency. You want a, right. lot, you want a lot more creativity. Right. Right. It's funny. I was listening to a podcast with uh, Mark uh, um, Andreessen, right, mm -hmm. about this. And he was talking about he had gone into a large law firm um, and they wanted to create a, I guess, an LLM or, uh, you know, the guardrails. And he was fully prepared to say, we can lock this down. It will never hallucinate. It won't make up cases. Mm -hmm. Right. And they looked at him and he said, well, the trade off is it's going to be less creativity. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, 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 no. We have junior associates who can easily determine if that's a real case or not. Right. Yeah. But what we want is the weird and wonderful. We wow. want those thought processes, those arguments that we would never think of. And they might appear crazy, but there might be basis on some fact, even if it's not a real case or that the other side could come at you with a, with reasoning or rationales that you would never consider. And you're flat footed. Yeah. So he was amazed that at that level that they understood the trade off, right? If you lock it down and make it less creative, you can eliminate hallucinations, but then you also limit yourself to the, I call it the weirdness and wonderful. That's, that's a phrase from um, Ethan Molek, a professor at the university of Pennsylvania uh, to keep AI weird. Right. And, and we had talked before this about, you had mentioned that the, you know, the large language models that are dominating, right? Uh, ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, and their general purpose. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they have a corpus of anything, everything that's been printed on the internet. And you had made the point that well-tuned models are now, you'd made it the Bloomberg point. Let's bring that up and talk a little bit about that. Sure. And I did, I did want to caveat that I just saw the headline, so there could be more to it, but there was a, a article that came out, Bloomberg spent $10 million training their own custom version of, I guess, uh, GPT 3.5. They made their own tinkering and improvements to make it very Bloomberg and finance focused. And it did a really good job. But as soon as GPT 4 came out, they tested their own custom high spend model specifically on finance versus GPT 4 on a set of finance questions. And GPT 4, the generic general model, uh, outperformed pretty significantly. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting to think about, um, the way that people interact with these models, especially from a business perspective, because we've experienced this too. We find a creative way to do something that the AI isn't capable of doing yet. And then three days later, the AI is now capable of doing that. So it's very fun, can sometimes be frustrating from a development side, but you also have to change the way you think about development and 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 guess and predict what are the things that we expect the general uh, the the models will be able to do on their own and what things do we really need to apply our specific expertise to? do you think it's building out its neuro network on that topic that three days later it can do it because it's certainly not picking up additional data the model's not being updated in three days mm -hmm. what's going on when it does things that it couldn't do in the past Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? It would just be a new release. Uh, so I think it's not the same model doing new things. It's just they push an update or there's some new 
uh, open source thing that connects three things together that now can achieve this result. That's the type of uh, updates that are happening. Because there are cases where it's learned languages and they don't know how it learned it. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. in the training material. It wasn't in anything that was, uh, and the theory is there's a lot more information in language than any of us ever realized that a whole worldview perspective, not a whole one, but a large percentage of the worldview can be extracted simply from words, which is just mind blowing, Gabe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd always thought when we started, we still need sensory, we still still need social learning. And yet it can do something with language that both linguists linguists and mathematicians have yet to crack the code mm -hmm. as to what is that next uh, level, you know, uh, what is that hidden understanding that seems to be encoded in language yeah. that our brains understand so well, but machines seem to have pretty good yeah. instincts too. Well, another parallel to that is a lot of times where the large language models struggle is things that require more logical reasoning or physics intuitions, because it doesn't have that data. It just has language data. But we were just talking about how people are now hooking up robotics to the large language models. Think of all the data that uh, has been used to train the, large, train the large language models. It's the data of the internet. But as we start adding more sensory data from robots with thousands, hundreds of thousands of sensors, picking up this data, being able to get the physics information as part of the models as well, that's, I think, going to be a big game changer to marry the logic and the understanding of how the world operates alongside the language and the, and the reasoning as well. well. Let's talk about that because you did study astrophysics at mm -hmm. Yale University, and it's amazing uh, the overlay between uh, physics and LLMs and artificial intelligence with mm -hmm. regard to worldviews and what we're seeing from Sura, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've created a worldview there. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that and, and the connection that you see uh, being in computational astrophysics mm -hmm. and, and, and what machines ability to create a, a universe uh, based on real physics, re real, mm -hmm. real laws of natural laws. Yeah, I, I'll take that in a very specific direction, which is, um, so I, I studied computational astrophysics, but I also spent a lot of time doing nuclear fusion research. And one of the big problems with nuclear fusion is having the correct materials to be able to uh, confine all the particles at a super, super high speed smashing into each other. Um, the materials decay or they don't have the right properties or whatever it might be. And AlphaFold, which is the Google DeepMind, like basic science protein folding thing, has now predicted uh, 2 million new stable materials where we used to have an understanding of 20,000. So 100x uh, our understanding of new possible materials. And what's really cool about that is every material that we have right now, a lot of times they have kind of unpredictable properties. So scientists just go in a lab, they construct a material that's stable, and then they run a bunch of experiments on it and say, wow, like this has really great flexibility and strength or whatever it might be. So they'll put it in an airplane or in electronics or in nuclear fusion. And now we have 100x more possibilities of different materials that we can test out and find all these different use cases and applications for that. That's really exciting from a, a basic science research understanding and development perspective. So I think there's a lot more of that that's coming about as well. It's just being able to enhance our understanding of the world and the changing the way that we do science research. And isn't that wild how many of these scientific pursuits overlap when we come to AI? I mean, on that same podcast with Lex Friedman, uh, Sam Altman talked about the, uh, the power demands and, yeah. you know, a fusion could be the answer and, and certainly traditional nuclear could be the answer too. Mm -hmm. And to think of Sura, which takes an hour to render or generate, render is probably the wrong word, but to generate, <laughs> you know, a, a minute worth of video, uh, that's a huge demand of use of CPU and electricity. So 
um, where are we going to get that from and how's it going to be, how's it going to impact our world? And certainly it can't come from fossil fuels are certainly not enough and, and the issues yeah. of climate change all compound that. So what do you think? Is that our future? We're going to be using a lot more electric uh, as we you turn to AI from, for the tasks that have done, been done manually or through the power of thinking and brains. Yeah. Energy generation needs are going to go up a lot. Uh, my background was <laughs> in, in college. I was a computational astrophysics and climate activist. So I definitely think about those energy considerations. Um, I uh, probably separate from the topic. I am pro nuclear uh, for a number of different reasons. Mostly, it's just the safest uh, thing that we know of and seems to uh, fit the power demand. But I also am very pro all forms of renewable energy and battery storage. I have a lot of friends that are working in the energy storage space as well. And that's the key. I mean, we got to figure out how to store energy. It's just one of the fleeting resources that I think is hard for the world to understand. You either use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. We think of everything as uh, inventory and, and uh, being able to, to be sustainable as far as what we draw from, but not energy. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I'm old enough I was in I was a senior in high school when Three Mile Island happened and I lived uh, maybe 100 miles from Harrisburg at the time and you know that uh, then then there was the movie that followed that yeah. um uh, I can't remember the name um it escapes me and that set nuclear energy back and one of the great th parallels to AI with nuclear energy is today we're running these nuclear power plants on 1970s technology Right. Mm -hmm. By not going forward, we lost so much innovation and safety and guardrails that we could have been investigating and overcoming and researching. Right. Mm -hmm. The same, I think, is true with AI. I think if we put the brakes on, um, we're not going to understand it. Right. And I think there's more of a risk to the world in not understanding its capacity, not understanding its potential, not understanding its risk. I think we've been much better off if we would have gone forward in a smart way and, mm -hmm. and predictably re responsibly developed nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. um, but today uh, nuclear engineers are hard to come by because mm -hmm. there was no jobs. There was, it wasn't a glamorous industry after that. There's mm -hmm. been no R and D because none were built and we're still back in 1973 mile Islandville. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think that's a powerful case study for why we need to go forward with AI. Yep. And we're asking the hard questions up front, unlike social media, which we never yep. ask any questions about, which is, has many risks that we're now learning about. I think smart people like yourself, fully aware of the risks of AI. Mm -hmm. And I think together as a coalition of the willing, we can manage it in a way that makes life better. I mean, I, in my own firm, Gabe, you should see the self-esteem that befalls upon a junior associate who can do high quality um, work product now. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to go back and forth with constant edits that they can actually achieve a level of, of contribution that's, that's up here instead of down here. Mm -hmm. That's good for the world. The self-esteem I see in junior associates to be able to produce at a high level is really compelling. And for me, as somebody who has been at this for 35 years, it makes my second act here in, in public relations so much more fulfilling because I can help them achieve um, a level of competency that took me 10 years, 15 years. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, mm -hmm. Being able to write for a CEO takes 10, 15, 20 years. Now they, individuals can get within 80% of that. Doesn't mean humans are factored out. It means they have to be edited and everything. But still, uh, like your own, I mean, th these financial advisors, most of them, um, they have an interest in working with their clients and not doing tactical, tedious, manual, redundant work. Yeah. Uh, that's a perfect segue. And I want to talk about the opportunities and the risks in the financial advisory context. So I talked about what your stake is doing, where we're doing document extraction to reduce manual entry. 
and we're doing this chat with a portfolio and then we're coming out soon with a whole bunch of other tools that will include note summaries and be able to help with follow-ups all, all of that kind of as part of an ai solution the other ways that advisors are using ai one people are using chat gpt as that brainstorming assistant to draft uh whatever it might be their newsletter anything market you know? updates Exactly. LinkedIn posts. Exactly. Two is we see people using AI slowly. This is getting there um, in the compliance context. So being able yeah, to let's like, talk about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah. so I'll just give a kind of a quick thing using AI to be able to scan different communications and flag something for, Hey, review this compliance officer. Uh, another way that people are using AI is like I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of tools that can join your meeting and that can get a transcript of the audio from the meeting, can summarize it, and can also grade you. So, hey, when you said this sentence, you lost engagement. Or when you said this sentence, the person smiled and that, that's like, this is what you should focus on next time. Uh, there are other tools that can take those meeting notes, populate a CRM. So there, there's all these different things. Most of the functionality that's really useful right now for advisors is saving you time in entering information, extracting information, and summarizing information. It's going to continue expanding, but that's where things are now. The risks, on the other hand, the SEC put out there, the main thing the SEC is concerned about is having AI directly interface with consumers providing financial advice. And you can, I mean, think about Three Mile Island, what is a parallel for our industry? Someone has a really big account. They ask GPT or they ask whatever robo-advisor that's directly interfacing, what should I do with this? They say, uh, invest it all in uh, some random cryptocurrency. It crashes. They lose all their money. They want to sue something. That that would scare a lot of people from, uh, from certain AI use cases. So th those are some of the risks that the SEC is looking at already is the direct interface between... Uh, an AI chatbot and a consumer on the topic of financial advice. And then obviously they're thinking about things like data security and hallucinations as well. We, we handle those with our, with our security policy, our SOC compliance, but those are, I think the opportunities are saving time and the risks are maybe having the AI be too much in front of the client and giving dangerous recommendations. Well, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, do you think there's a realm where I like working with my financial advisor, right? And, you know, you have trusted advisors as you grow older and you become more sophisticated in these things. So you got an estate attorney, right? Mm -hmm. You have, um, in my case, I have shareholders other than myself mm -hmm. who, who I have to consider because how do you transfer, how do you see wealth, right? Out of your, out of what you hold. I have a financial advisor. I have a CPA, right? And it's funny, I got, so I got an issue last week and the estate attorney wants to talk to the financial planner, right? Now he goes, let me call her first, right? And I'm thinking, well, I could, I'm a smart guy. I'd like to be on that call, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I do think there's a realm where as the client, there are certain things um, like, yeah, I, I if you make an assumption, right, uh, for the future, like, you know, you do a charitable remainder trust, right? I'd like to see, you know, what those assumptions are and whether they really align with what my goals are, right? Yeah. So all too often I find that I express myself, but then somehow it's kind of lost, right? It's not remembered uh, yeah. in the process, and I have to re re reset where the questioning isn't empathetic enough. Yeah. Meaning like, I'll give you a basic example. Like who handles the finances in your family? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a question. Well, uh, like a lot of entrepreneurs, my wife handles our, and she's very sophisticated in this because I've, I run a business, right? And I never had time to, you know, by the time I'm done, my books here, the last thing in the world, I was the shoemaker's, uh, son, right? But no one has ever asked me this question on that. Why? Hmm. Why? 
And if you were to ask why to that question, you could open an entire conversation in the note-taking process Mm -hmm. about our philosophy and what drives our Mm decision-making and how we come to money. These are issues that aren't easy for a lot of people to open up to because Mm -hmm. we're taught you never talk about money or or you should be more guarded or or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that holds tremendous value, Gabe, and that, you know, that process by gaining that information and then making it actionable is something that right now I feel is broken. Mm -hmm. It, It just doesn't exist because most of the questions are, are surface level. I don't know your thoughts. Interesting. Well, I can give you my thoughts from a consumer perspective, from a product developer perspective, from a, a where AI is going perspective. I mean, I do think that a lot of people think that that asking that question is the main value that they provide as an advisor, right? That it's not just a formulaic check the box, fill out a form that the advisor is there to be able to say why in the right moment. Now that doesn't mean that everyone does it obviously based on your experience, if you've never had someone do it, but that's something that I think a lot of people right now are saying, this is why I provide additional value over an algorithm or, or AI is having that relationship, being able to ask why. Um, from the product developer standpoint, I still think you don't want to put AI directly in front of a consumer, but having an assistant, if it's joining your call and taking notes anyway, uh, maybe you could send a gentle nudge to the financial advisor. You might want to ask why type of thing. So I, I think that's probably coming too, is just, um, you know, one way to describe what we're building here at your stake is a co-pilot for financial advisors. And that co-pilot would be able to, again, have the advisor be the full decision maker, but just, hey, I'll take all your notes for you. I'll give you a nudge when maybe you should remember to ask this question. Um, I'll, I'll do the analytics for you. So that, I think that's the direction that the field is moving, is having that co-pilot AI assistant there to be able to help you with those types of things. So I do think that will become more uh, common in the future and easier to to achieve as a consumer too. How is that done now with the advisor? So if you're doing uh, tax loss harvesting, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. Or sometimes when it's the best, it's dependent on the market where you can get the best, uh, where you can get the best loss or whatever. Mm-hmm. H- how do they do that today? Is that, uh, are they alerted or is it a weekly review of every portfolio? How does it work t- in the, in today's world without, you know, your stake? Sure. So there's a ton of variants. Uh, so specifically on tax loss harvesting or about or just AI any, using doing optimizing alerts. the whole re, the whole portfolio, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, a lot of advisors are doing tax loss harvesting once a year before the end of the year because it just takes a long time to think about. There are direct indexing technologies that oftentimes incorporate daily tax loss harvesting. So they just have an algorithm that always looks for tax loss harvesting opportunities. But and I was just using enough, that as an example. It can yeah. be any, any, any task along the continuum. Yeah, to, to broaden that up, there are more and more tools that are using a combination of AI and just basic algorithms to provide alerts. Hey, this person is going to turn 60. You should reach out to them about this. Or, uh, oh, it looks like this person if they've synced up their bank or whatever it might be. Sometimes advisors have that with their clients. They're making a ton of purchases on uh, whatever it might be. You might want to reach out to them and see if anything's changing in their life. You know, Or uh, it's kind of like um, Amazon product recommendations. We see that you're taking this action with your behavior. You might be interested in that. There's more and more tools for advisors understanding, scanning the client base, seeing behavior, seeing activity, seeing demographics, and then suggesting action items for financial advisors. So that maybe is a broader way to think about those alerts. And then you could also imagine, hey, uh, like a research assistant, advisor, when you're doing your fund manager due diligence, don't forget to ask this, this, and this, and it looks like we're missing that. Or when you're having your initial meeting with a client, uh, ask why. Make sure you always cover this kind of just like a little uh, reminder for the, the 
those interactions as well. Um, I actually don't know. I don't think that exists right now, but that I, I, is a pretty near future in my in my prediction. Well, it's a fascinating world, and your background makes it even more interesting to me because I think, again, as I said, these sciences, different sciences, for the first time in my life, it's crossing, for instance, my my profession, right? We mm -hmm. have, and it's an alignment of physics. It's an alignment of neuroscience. It's an alignment of social science and behavioral science, financial markets. It's an alignment of coding. It's an alignment of technology. It's, it, it, it's an alignment of energy use. It's just a remarkable time. We're fortunate, I think, Gabe, to be alive right now. I look forward mm -hmm. to what the future holds. And I think it, your firm holds, uh, it holds great uh, prospects for your firm and what you're doing in financial services. Thanks for being with us. And uh, uh, any closing comments? How can someone get in touch with you? Sure. So they can reach out Gabe at yourstake.org or just go onto our website, yourstake.org. That will have all of our information. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn too. So find me, Gabe Risman. Um, and Greg, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. And this is quite a fun conversation. I love the way that you're thinking about and are on top of all of the, the latest updates in AI. So this was, this was robust and enjoyable. I, I hear you. It only takes two hours a day to stay on top <laughs> yeah. of all of it, right? <laughs> this morning, I'm trying to make an avatar of myself on a new platform, you know, and I'm like, oh, damn, I got to learn this whole thing to make <laughs> it happen. So it's never stops. It all you and, and leaders have to lead, right? Like I'm the head of the firm. I have to make a safe and, 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 and learning environment for my employees. And if I don't understand how it works. Yeah. This is something that cannot be delegated. This yeah. is something that you need a coalition of the willing, right? We have 100 people. So many ideas percolate up now because originally I was adamant. This is the future, folks. It's just not learning AI. It's mastering AI. Mm -hmm. If you do that, the firm's future will be assured, but also your career will be assured. So thanks for being with us. Great conversation, Gabe. Love it. Thank you, Greg. Take care. This podcast is a production of Gregory FCA. If you enjoyed our discussion today and want to continue exploring the transformative power of AI, please check out more episodes and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.